So take your Bibles, please, and open them up to the Gospel according to Luke chapter 24. I think I just threw you for a loop. Not the Gospel of John. We are actually in Luke. So uh, the members of the immediate Ward family, we went to St. Louis the last few days to help Robert and Marcia celebrate 50 years of marital bliss. Most of it bliss. No. <laughs> That's right. Very good. And we had a great time. And so, but with that trip and then Falls Creek coming up, I literally just don't have enough time to give it the honest effort in John. So uh, we're going to take a couple of weeks away from John, but we have some tremendous information here in Luke chapter 24. Have you ever wondered, like, right at the end of the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry? So this is after his whole three year public ministry. He's been arrested, he has been crucified put in the grave. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. He is just about to ascend into heaven. And wouldn't it be awesome if we just knew, like, what were his final words? I mean, like, after three years with his disciples, and he knows he's getting ready to leave them all alone, wouldn't it be awesome if we knew, like, what, he, what might he have said right at the end, you know, to just sort of summarize it all here? Oh, wow, we do have that. Luke chapter 24. Some people call these Jesus big three. The big three, and it is phenomenal. Just the final hard-hitting three things that Jesus said to his apostles. And I want to remind you that, that he is, he's been arrested, beaten, falsely tried, falsely accused, crucified, placed in the tomb three days, and rose from the dead. And yet, after all that, up the up and down emotional, psychological, spiritual upheaval of all of that, his followers now here, oh, and I'm, I'm going back to heaven, you know, to, to be alone, you know. And so what would Jesus say? Jesus, big three. The first thing he taught in Luke 24 is just what I would call a biblical theology. A biblical theology. And you're going, oh, that's kind of nerdy theological. Stay with me. A biblical theology. So this one is Jesus comes up to two guys, two, two of his disciples. And they are on what has become really one of the most famous roads in human history. It's called the road to, does anybody know? Emmaus, the road to Emmaus. And these are two of Jesus' followers. And again, they are sad and dejected. Because all they know is that this man that they have placed their total hope in to be the Messiah of God, their Savior, and yet they watched everything happen, Passion Week. And all they know is that he has been crucified and buried. They've not yet heard that he is raised from the dead. And yet Jesus comes up to them and begins to talk to them. And Luke writes that they were not allowed to recognize him. A pretty simple of God. God just kept them from recognizing this is Jesus. And they just start to talk with him. And I love the way he has fun with them. He's kind of baiting them a little bit. Like, you know, why so sad? What's going on? And they're like, dude, do you know? Have you not heard? I mean, Jesus. And they go through, the, you know. And he kind of lets them talk for a little bit. And, and they're just so sad and they're so dejected. But then he be begins to speak to them verse 25 Luke 24 verse 25 and he said to them oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory and beginning with Moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and I want to tell you, if I could time travel, I mean, if I could be a fly buzzing around and see and hear, what might that have been like? I can just imagine Jesus saying, hey, guys, because these dudes knew the Bible, and the Bible then was nothing but the Old Testament. I can just imagine him saying, hey, do you remember back in Genesis 1 when there was nothing, I mean, nothing had ever been created, and the Word of God spoke, and out of nothingness, everything was created. Guess what? I am the Word. That is all about me. You know, we read in John 1 that, that in the beginning, what, the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I can imagine him going further. And how about Genesis 3? You guys remember, this is after the fall, after Adam and Eve already ate the fruit and God is handing out judgment to them and to the devil who tempted them. And do you remember when he said that, hey, devil, Eve's seed is going to rise up someday and destroy you. He's going to knock you in the head and it will be a victory blow. Oh, you're going to bruise him on the hill, but he's going to hit you on the head and destroy you. Do you remember that? Jesus says to them, he goes, let me just tell you, guess who I am? That's all about, I am Eve's seed. And on that cross, the devil thought he had a victory, but oh my goodness. Look at the tomb. The tomb is empty. I struck him in the head. It's all about me. 
And he might go on, you know, hey, do you remember when God killed that ram? This is right after Adam and Eve sinned. And they immediately realized their nakedness. And by the way, nakedness to this day represents shame. That's why we don't run around naked. Thank God there's a lot of ugly nudity out there. We don't need to get into that. But anyway, just n nakedness all through the Bible represents our shame. We are exposed before God. And what did God do to show grace and mercy to Adam and Eve when they realized they were naked? He killed that ram and covered them with the skins. And Jesus is going, and that is all about me because I am the Lamb of God. And it is through my death that I cover up people's nakedness and their shame and their iniquity that makes them a stench. And God is all about me. He goes on, hey, do you remember when God flooded the world back in the days of Noah? Remember that? I want to tell you I am the flood because I am coming at the end of time in judgment. And I will destroy everybody who has rebelled, rebelled against God. But I'm also the ark of safety. You remember God opened up the door of the ark and Noah and anybody who would listen, who, anybody who would repent could go into the ark. Only Noah and his family did. I'll tell you, it's all about me. I am the door. If anyone enters in, they can spend eternity with me in heaven. He goes on. Do you remember the Passover? This is after there's the children of Israel, and they've lived in Egypt for 400 years. And the, the death angel is going to pass over, and God is going to kill every firstborn anywhere and everywhere in the whole country of Egypt. And yet, if my people will kill a lamb and paint the blood on the doorpost, when the death angel comes, I will pass over and spare them in my grace and mercy. I am that lamb. It is my blood that covers people and protects them from the wrath of God. He might go on further. You know, after God rescued them way out in the wilderness, they're about to die of thirst, and, and, and Moses took his staff and struck the rock at Horeb, and water just flowed miraculously. And he might have told those guys on the road to Emmaus, I am that water. We just read it last week. If anyone thirsts, what should they do? Drink of the Lord Jesus Christ. He might have gone way deeper into history. You know, King David, I'm talking mighty King David. Do you remember when he said in Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, this is King David, and he would say, that is all about me because as mighty as King David was, and even though I am his descendant, I am his Lord because I am the Lord. I am the word through which everything can. You might, he might have gone on and said, you know, all those times in the Old Testament where, where it refers to this mysterious, the angel of the Lord came down. And it would call it an angel, but then curiously it begins to refer to this angel as God. And Jesus would say, that's me. That was a pre-incarnate visitation. Before I was ever born in the stable in Bethlehem, I visited earth, the angel of the Lord. It's just unbelievable. He could have gone on and on and on. And the point of it all, the point he is saying in that little teaching session as they approach Emmaus is, the Bible is all about Jesus. It is a biblical theology. And I think about that and I realize how absolutely misused the Bible is today. Misused. I mean, there are people who've turned it into the prosperity gospel. I could preach a whole sermon, especially in this city we live in, with its enormous, outsized influence of the prosperity gospel. And I just want to tell you, if you have friends and relatives and neighbors who have bought into that, you need to understand that is not the gospel. There is a very real chance that they are lost in their sins and headed for hell and think that they know God. The prosperity gospel is not the gospel because there is only one gospel and it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you throw prosperity or health and wealth or any other name on top of it, it is not the gospel anymore. And yet there are preachers out there preaching that and misusing the Bible. It, all, you go into many, many other churches and this is very prevalent today, just that basically the Bible and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all that power and all that holy stuff, it is all to help you have your best life now. How to help you improve. How to be a better person. Again, you can be a great person, have a blessed life, and just land straight in eternal hell on the day you die. Because the Bible is all about Jesus. I don't know what the driving passion of your life is, but if you are a disciple of Jesus, the driving passage of your life needs to be Jesus Christ. Your life needs to be wrapped up in reading about Jesus, learning about Jesus, loving Jesus, serving Jesus. That is a biblical theology for your life, and that is the first of just what I call Jesus' big three. Big three, biblical theology. So what's the second one? What will be the second thing? Remember, it's just right before Jesus is ascending to heaven, and he's meeting with his disciples. So he's through talking to these two dudes on the road to Emmaus, and it's a little bit later, and Jesus talks about just what we will call gospel centrality. That's point number two, gospel 
centrality. So Luke records what happens just a little bit later. Jesus is now meeting with more. It's more than just two. It's more of his disciples. Drop down to verse 45. So we're still in Luke 24. Look at verse 45. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So when Jesus broke his whole ministry down, his big three, the second thing he stressed right here is, is a gospel centrality. What is it? The Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead and then repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed everywhere. And so just really right there, that is Christianity. What's it all about? What should be the driving force of your life? What are we here for? This right here is Christianity. And I think about that and I realize, oh wow, there's a whole lot of people who name the name of Christ and yet that's not the way they do religion. That's not their version of Christianity because for some people religion is all about self-improvement, right? We talked about that a moment ago, just self-improvement. For a lot of other people, religion is about therapy. You know, you just you can hear this message alive and well today. Jesus can help you recover from your addictions, whatever they might be. Jesus can help you with your depression. Jesus can build your self-esteem. And yes, Amen. Yes, he can. He does all those things. But I want, to, I want you to hear, those are byproducts of following Jesus. They aren't the main thing. They are not gospel centrality. Well, what else do people make religion all about? Some people see Jesus in the gospels serving people, and so they divide their life, or devote their life rather, to just humanitarian causes. I mean, they volunteer. They serve, they go on mission trips. That's great again. Other people see Jesus' authority in the Bible and they know, okay, well, I'm a child of the king. And so they claim that right for power in their life. Power for success, power for influence, power for favor, power for leadership, power for promotion. Do you get the point there? Who's sitting on the throne there? They are, right? They claim all of that. Now, here's the thing. Almost everything I have mentioned here with regards to how people think about religion, a lot of those are good things, but those are not the good news. And the gospel is the good news. Even non-Christian people can, can dabble in all that stuff that people have made church all about. There's all kinds of unsaved people who da dance around the edges. You look at every world religion, and they never jump into the only religion. So Christianity has this very singularly focused gospel centrality. And according to Jesus, it is first of, first of all, all about him. Be number one, a biblical theology. And then secondly, it is all about the gospel. Gospel centrality. What is it again? The Christ should suffer on the third day rise again. And then repentance for the forgiveness of our sins should be preached and proclaimed in his name. You know, I think about that. as We just apply that personally. So that's a lot of theology. You know, just right there. But here's where it's real. You don't need someone to help you. You don't, you don't need just a little bit of help to have a better life, be a better person. That's not what we need. We don't, we don't need a, a helper. What do we need? We need a Savior. We need a Savior, someone to save us from hell, save us from our sins. So we don't get right with God through grace and, and then you sort of stay right with God the rest of our lives through a whole lot of religion, a whole lot of doing good, you know, all the do stuff of religion. That's not what it's all about. We need the crucified and risen Christ every day. And so just personalize it. When you think of your miserable sin hangups, and I'll tell you, many of us have just brought them right in here. I don't need to tell you what they are. You know exactly in your mind and in your heart. You know absolutely where you're disobedient, where you're not faithful where you struggle, the things where, I mean, you, you have grooved in some ruts in your life, and man, you have given it to the Lord a million times, and yet you still slip right back into them. What are you going to do, you miserable fail, failure? I mean, how are you going to pull yourself out of that? I mean, you, know, you used to believe you could pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and come to church enough and read the Bible enough, and all the good. What are you going to do now? Because you have failed now for the millionth time. Where are you going now, miserable failure? And listen, I'm speaking to myself. Where can we go? other than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, killed for you and for me, and yet raised from the dead for our victorious life 
in him. That's, that's where we go. Christianity isn't about just helping you become a better person. Christianity is about taking the filthy, miserable, depraved you and me and making us absolutely holy in the sight of God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just have to come back to this all over and over and over. So what's number three? We're talking about the big three of Jesus Christ, right? He is just about to ascend into heaven. He has been arrested, beaten, tried, killed, buried, raised from the dead, about to leave his followers. Number three, what's he going to say just before he ascends? He gives a mission mandate. A mission mandate. And we see this in verse 48, Luke 24, 48, where Jesus says to his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. I mean, those people saw it all, right? And behold, he says to them, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, I want you to flip immediately to Acts 1. Luke wrote these words in Luke 24. Luke also wrote Acts. He wrote this, and so it's almost like he could have just kept on writing. It could have been one long book, but it's not. But I want you to flip to Acts 1 because he's absolutely continuing this exact same message from the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, a mission mandate. So we are in Acts 1. Look at verse 8. And Jesus says to these same people, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And get this verse 9. nine. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So the final thing that Jesus said to his disciples, and by extension to us today as disciples, is the third and final part of his big three, and it is a mission mandate. Let me re repeat what Jesus said. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. I, you talk about a letdown if you were a disciple. But, I mean, I'd be like, we make fun of Haley because she says, wait, what? If something catches Haley off guard, wait, what? I think every disciple that day, when they just saw his feet, and they're like, he's gone, they were like, wait, what? <laughs> he, what what's going on here? You know, it's like, wait, what? I mean, what else would you say? Talk about a letdown. And so what did they do? Well, we know what they do from the book of Acts. They did exactly what you and I would do. They got depressed. They got dejected. In fact, then they got scared. Oh, my goodness. Are they going to arrest us, too? I mean, look what they did to him, and now they're going to do that to us. So they're all huddled and hiding and, and fearing for their lives until exactly what Jesus said. Until what? The Holy Spirit of God descended on them with power. And so you wonder today, Jesus left us with this mission mandate to tell the whole world about all this. Well, how in the world are we going to share the gospel both near in Jerusalem and all the way to the end of the earth? I mean, have you ever tried to tell somebody about Jesus? Don't raise your hand, but, man, if you, on wobbly knees and sweaty palms and quaky voice, if you have ever tried to open your mouth and just tell people that they're going to hell without Jesus, and if you're communicating that, I'm telling you that is not easy. And if you've done it, you know the fearfulness of it, you feel inadequate, it's just scary, and it's hard, and you will never do it successfully without whom? The Holy Spirit of God. But oh my goodness, when he is at work, he works in spite of your shaking knees and sweaty palms and forgetful mind. And your ma mouth gets all jumbled up. You reflect back later and you're like, why didn't I say that? And why didn't I say that? And oh, that would have been better if I did this. And it doesn't matter because if the Holy Spirit comes in, he is unstoppable. In fact, the Holy Spirit, according to the New Testament and according to the Lord Jesus, he is like the wind that blows against dead sinners hearts in fact do you remember earlier in john's gospel jesus is teaching one of the elite leaders named nicodemus and he tells nicodemus you got to be born again remember that and then jesus described the mystery because nicodemus is like well i'm a grown man how am i going to get back in my mama's tummy you know all that stuff and and jesus begins to describe the mystery of how dead sinners i'm talking spiritually dead sinners no awareness of god no caring about god no following of god couldn't follow him if they wanted to Jesus describes the mystery, and he says, The wind blows where it wishes. I'm just quoting from Jesus in John 3. He says, The wind, speaking to the Holy Spirit, blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
Well, what do we know about wind? And we know a little bit about wind here in Oklahoma, do we not? I'm talking violent wind. What is our most violent wind called in Oklahoma? A tornado, you know. We know about tornadoes. My goodness, we know about hurricanes. We see those things on the news. Well, here's what we know about wind, violent wind storms. Number one, they are independent. Independent. What I mean is they have a mind of their own. You ever notice that? Have you ever, ever, has anybody, I mean, we've got pretty cool weather radar and they can track storms and all that, but has anybody at Channel 6 uh, Weather Department, have they figured out how to reroute a storm yet? Oh, no, we don't want you over here. Avoid all that. That's prime real estate. No, you know, don't hit his hat. No, they just, it's independent. Wind just goes. You know, you, you follow hurricanes. It's interesting. You can look at the coastline where a hurricane hits and it's just like it hit right there along that part of the coast and then not right here. But then over here, it's in, you know, same thing with tornadoes. They just have a mind. They can land anywhere that they want to. And I just want to tell you that explains how God can save one member of a family and nobody else. That might be you. You might almost be the only person in your whole family who even knows anything about the Lord Jesus and loves him and knows that he saved you from an eternal hell. Everybody else, brothers, sisters, mom, dad, grandparents might think, well, you know, they're kind of an idiot. They're kind of a religious wacko, you know. We'll give it to, you know, I don't know. You know, why is it just you? Because the wind of the Lord is independent. He blows when and where and with the force that he wants. Secondly, we know about wind is that it is irresistible. It's not just independent, it's irresistible. You, know, you look at these vacation homes down along the coastal regions that get hit with hurricanes. Man, if they've been hit before, guess what the owners did? They put on these big old hurricane doors, and they can pull them down over the doors and the windows. They're just trying to protect their property, right? They're just trying to be prepared. But let's be, let's be honest. When a big hurricane hits, does any of that do any good? No. I mean, it's, it's irresistibly strong, the force of the storm is. And I just want to tell you that when you head out on Jesus' mission mandate, this third of his big three, the hardest heart that you will ever come across. I mean, the person in your world who you know, man, they are that far from the gate of hell. They will never, they'll never come to the Lord. They are just, just nothing. You know, their life is so messed up. They're so hard-hearted, whatever it is. I'm telling you, when you head out with the mission mandate and the Holy Spirit is at work, he is irresistible. He will come across, he will slam against whatever heart he wants to. And it's not that they're going to come. I say it a lot. God doesn't bring anybody into his kingdom against their will, kicking and screaming. There has been nobody that has entered the eternal kingdom of heaven saying, I hate it. I don't want it. Dig it in their heels. Hold me back. I don't want to go. This is the stupid. Nobody. Every single person. You see, because God, that's what we do when we are dead in our sins. I don't want it. I don't want to hear it. It's stupid. Be religious if you want to. How do I know that's the right way when they're doing it over here in that way in China and India and all those places? You know, that's what it used to be. But I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit irresistibly comes upon a dead heart and brings new life, it is with joy, joy that they rush in. Maybe fear and trembling. But you can't, wild horses can't hold you back. When you are ready to be saved and the Holy Spirit has come, it is going to happen. You want to do it, and it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Third, wind is invisible. It's independent, irresistible, but it's also invisible. I mean, that's what makes tornadoes devastating, right? You just can't really see them coming, especially if it's at night. You know, it's just like, it's not here. Oh, wow, it's here now. And, you know, kind of, it's funny now we get back to the news. You know, nowadays they can kind of track it, and that's pretty amazing. They'll even send crazy guys out driving around, you know, those storm chasers. You ever seen that? You know, here it is. They're describing it. I'm like, yeah, I can see it. You know, you can almost see their car shaking. But is, is anybody here old like me? Do you remember the days of tornadoes when we were kids? You know, and I loved it. It's like word kind of spread that there's a tornado. And really looking back on it, that just means now we know it just conditions are right that there might be a tornado. We'd all gather outside, you know, and, the, and they'd usually send the kids with the women down into a storm shelter if you had one. But I can remember the men. They're always like, ain't, ain't scared of no tornado. I can, the men in my world were always just standing outside looking around. It's like, what are you going to do if one hits, you know? Because they're invisible. I mean, am I the only one that remembers that? You know, and every now and then we kids just slip up. I remember sometimes standing by, like, my dad or something thinking, okay, you know, I really don't know what we'd have done if one really happened, you know. They're invisible, you know. And I just want to tell you that when you live with Jesus' mission mandate, all you got to do is open your mouth and just start to tell people about Jesus. Because you literally then are unleashing a tornado on them. 
It's invisible to them. They don't even know what's happening. You're stumbling and bumbling and you're not really making sense, but you're doing the best that you can, right? And you may well have unleashed the tornado of the Holy Spirit. And if he is ready to convert them, I'm telling you he will do it. And it might happen right then or it might be three weeks from now because he's invisible. He comes when he wants, and nobody knows when it's going to happen. You and I just have the mission mandate to open our mouths. So here's the thing. Jesus is about ready to ascend into heaven, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit. That's already come. He came. He came 40 days later, 50 days later. I always get those messed up. I think it's 50 days later he sent the Holy Spirit. That changed everything. Because when Jesus was on earth, where did he live? Anybody remember what country did he live in? Come on now, are we back? Somebody, be, be brave. I'll help you. It starts with is. The rest is real. <laughs> Israel. Was he living in the United States of America? No. We weren't even around then. If we were around, in fact, there wasn't even an English language yet. Nobody had even heard of King James before his famous Bible, you know. But if there had been a USA, could Jesus have been in the USA and Israel all at the same time? What do you think? No. He's limited to one space and time just like we are. Oh, but my goodness, when he ascended into heaven and sent his spirit, guess what the beautiful thing about the spirit of Christ is? He's limitless. He has no boundaries. Nothing can stop it. Because oh, here we are worshiping God through his spirit right now. And there's a church, well, Trinity Baptist Church right down here on the corner. Guess what they're doing? Worshiping the same God through the same spirit that we are. And so it is an amazing thing. When Jesus left and then sent his spirit on his disciples and they went out with this mission mandate, according to the Lord's own words, he said, you will go further and do greater things than even I did. I used to scratch my head and go, how how is that? Do better things than Jesus? Yes, because you have to understand, when he said those things, where was he? His two feet were still standing on Israeli dirt, right? He had not yet been glorified. He had not yet ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God as the king of the whole universe. He was the Lord, and he worked miracles, but I'm telling you, when he gave you and me the spirit, it increased the geographic scope and the power of what he would accomplish through the power of his spirit. And it is amazing. God is doing that right now. I mean, in these crazy, divisive times we live in, as churches shrink in size and more and more Americans leave the faith, don't get worried. Who cares? God is in control of it all because he is the spirit that is still blowing, and he is powerful, and we just live with this mission mandate. And so as we close... I just want to remind you of Jesus' big three. Number one, he taught a biblical theology. It is all about Jesus. I just want to encourage you, make your whole life about that. Yes, jobs are important. Education is important. Saving for the future is important. Bettering yourself is important. Taking family trips is important. Many, many things are good and important. But I'm telling you, you better make sure those things fit part and parcel into biblical theology, into your love and service of Jesus Christ. So that's number one. Secondly, gospel centrality. This thing that we do called church, religion, Christianity, it is all about the gospel. There are books out there that will just sort of lead you astray to teach you, and I'm talking churchy books, teach you how to have a better life and how to get this and how to be a better husband and a better this. And, you know, Listen, be very, very careful with all of that because Christianity is gospel-focused. It is centralized in the cross and the empty tomb and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is reigning. Get your life in line with that. He is the king. He's coming back. Don't let him find you or me so far astray out here that we were never followers. We thought we were, but we aren't. Get it right. Know exactly why God accepts you and loves you. And it is only through the grace and mercy of Christ. And just make that the center of your life. And then third and finally, as you do all of that, have this mission mandate about your life. Just be willing to open your mouth and just tell people about Jesus. Those three right there. Stand to your feet, please, as we pray. And God, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus. What a gift that he is. And just for these three big, powerful things that he taught his disciples. And again, by extension, taught us, is teaching us today. Help us with these things, God. Help us just to honor you and to celebrate the gift of your son more and more. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.